Hello, uh, ENBS 1000. This is Paul Clements, Professor of Political Science here at Western. And um, let me just start off by sharing my screen. I'm gonna be talking about the, um, the international politics of the climate crisis. And I just wanna start off by saying that this is not a happy presentation. I think that to understand the international politics, we've got to start from understanding the incredible harms that carbon polluters are imposing, um, certainly on future generations, but also on the more vulnerable in, in today's world and in, in, in decades to come. Um, and for the most part, what we're talking about is advanced countries, particularly the United States, imposing harms on the developing countries who, who suffer the most harms and are least uh, prepared to address them and particularly the responsibility of the United States due to um, our having contributed the most carbon pollution historically, um, due to our this being the strongest country uh, in geopolitical terms in, the, in today's global system, and also due to the, the history of climate change negotiations where you'll see the United States has played kind of a spoiler role um, in the past. I think that the fundamental challenge uh, to address climate change is political. And as much as we talk about and hear about political issues here at the local Kalamazoo, Western Michigan University, Michigan and national level, all of this local state and national politics doesn't matter a whole lot if we don't get global politics to work, international politics, it's a global problem um, it doesn't matter which country in the world produces the carbon pollution. And all the aspects of the climate crisis, reducing carbon, carbon pollution and addressing its effects need to be addressed together at the global level. And as I will argue, that just is not being done effectively. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how the international community is organized to address the climate crisis. I'm gonna argue that so far, the international community is failing by, by any objective measure. Um, the central challenges, I think, are for the United States to take responsibility for its carbon pollution, and then we can help the other advanced countries to do the same thing. We need to build effect international institutions with the powers to effectively promote mitigation and adaptation and address harms, particularly harms to climate migrants. These are the standard terms that we use in the international negotiations. Mitigation is reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, of course, reducing things will reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Adaptation is adapting to the, to the effects of climate change, sea level rise, drought, stronger storms, et cetera. But even with adaptation, there are a lot of harms. And so we need institutions to address those harms. And I think the, the most significant category of harms really is to climate migrants, people who lose their homes, have to, have to abandon their homes, go find another life somewhere. Um, uh, I think that that's really uh, a particular harm, both because it's so great, but also because we're not, it's not being adequately addressed at this time, as I, will, as I will demonstrate. I think the underlying challenge is to build the political power to promote this global agenda at the national level, particularly here in the United States, although also in other, other advanced countries. So to think about climate change, I think it's helpful to think about it in terms, in terms of how the international politics works as one problem, two perspectives. Um, that the international community is divided in terms of climate change discussions into advanced countries and developing countries. And they have different perspectives on these three areas, mitigation, adaptation, and harms. For mitigation, the advanced countries have high historic carbon pollution, particularly the United States high but falling present carbon pollution. Right now, the United States is at 14 tons per person per year. And we're mostly industrialized. We got to be industrialized largely through carbon polluting activities, which makes us relatively rich, relatively better able to address these issues. By contrast, the developing countries have low historic carbon pollution, low but rising current carbon pollution. And where, where United States is at 14 tons per person, for example, India is only at two tons per person per year. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a, a, a sense that the developing countries have a right to development, that 
the industrialized countries got rich largely through burning fossil fuels. The, the, the developing countries are still relatively poor and they need to industrialize. And if they can't, and, and so the question is, how can they do that? Um, whether with carbon, carbon based fuels or with renewable energy. Um, in terms of adaptation, adapt, adapting to the, to the effects of climate change, there are significant demands everywhere. You know, certainly here in the United States, we face changes in weather, things getting hotter, drought, um, bigger, bigger storms, et cetera. But we do have more resources to address these things. In terms of developing countries, there the demands are just greater. Um, the, the, the heat, they're already pretty hot, and so increasing heat affects them worse. Um, they, they face more issues with drought, with sea level rise, it just turns out. Um, and they just have less resources to address these issues, and they, they face greater harms with less resources. So again, in terms of the harms, here in the United States and in advanced countries, there are, of course, harms, but we have the resources. In the international, in the, for developing countries, the, the term that gets used for harms in the international negotiations, they call it loss and damage. And, um, you know, we think of perhaps the uh, floods where Pakistan, a third of Pakistan was flooded this last in, in 2022, costing like, like $30 billion, just as one example. Um, they have a lot bit greater loss and damage than the advanced countries and fewer resources to deal with them. Another harm that isn't part of the international discussions but needs to be is the harm to climate migrants. I've been working on this and from my own research, it looks like we, there are likely to be something in the area of 400 million climate migrants by 2050, about 4% of the global population. This is people who, who have to leave their homes one way or another due to climate change. Um, uh, if we do a better job with adaptation and reducing carbon pollution, that 400 million might go down as far as 200 million, but it's gonna be a lot one way or another. And this is a significant issue that has not yet entered the politics, but, but needs to do. Um, so if we look at the, at the way the international negotiations go, this is the background. The advanced countries know they have this situation, the developing countries know where they are, and they've been in discussions over this period of time. The main organization in which these discussions take place is the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, UNFCCC. And um, that convention is both the text of the agreement started off in, in 1992, and it's also the organization that that, 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 that agreement launched in 1992. Um, every year there are meetings of the UNFCCC. They're called conferences of the parties, parties to this agreement. So that's this COP, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, COP 15, I think. COP 21 was, was the Paris Agreement in, in 2015. Um, so they're all, they're, those are all meetings of this UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention. The very first of these meetings was in 1992. That was when basically the international community recognized the climate crisis or, or climate change at that time. It wasn't yet a crisis as an issue and said, we need to get organized to address it. They have this big meeting. Um, and the United States, along with about 190 other countries, uh, agreed to this convention where the aim was to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic, that is human caused, interference with the climate system. And simply at this level, um, we've clear, it's clearly failed. We clearly have already really dangerous uh, human intervention with the climate system. Um, also, the aim, also the, the, the original 1992 agreement recognized the responsibilities of the advanced countries and the right to development of the developing countries. In the text from 1992, the advanced countries aimed to return to 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2000. This was their, their original objective. But if we look at what actually happened, we see that from 1990, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions, the main one being carbon dioxide, have just continued to increase. Um, the, the aim was to get them back to 1990 levels by the year 2000, but, but we're way ahead of that. And even the total carbon pollution since 1992 is now greater, greater total than all the carbon pollution for the, for the many, many decades bef before, since the, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so this is just one piece of evidence for how 
uh, the, the, the UNFCC has failed in one of its initial, in its main objective. What about finance? Uh, in the original agreement in 1992, it states the developed country parties shall also assist the developing country parties that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change in meeting costs of adaptation to those adverse effects. Here, the parties means parties to the convention, the advanced countries then, um, the developed countries, they basically said, look, okay, you know, we know, we know we've caused the problem for the most part, we're richer, um, it's gonna take developing countries time, it's, a lot of the, the harms are gonna fall on them, and, and that we should help them cover the cost of, of adapting to, to, to these effects. Um, also, it stated in 1992, the extent to which developing country parties will effectively implement their commitments under the convention will depend on the effective implementation by developed country parties of their commitments under the convention related to financial resources and transfer of technology and will take fully into account that economic and social development and poverty er eradication are the first and overriding priorities of the developing country parties. Okay, this is maybe, you know, this is how these, the, the kind of, uh, language these these conventions use, but what they're saying is that look, if the developing if the, if the developed countries, the advanced countries, um, don't do what they what they're saying, if they don't take their responsibility seriously, then you, you you shouldn't expect the developing countries to do their part. Well, um, after 1992, it took longer than it's expected. It took five years to come to an, an initial proposal for how to move forward. And that was in um, COP3, the third meeting of conference of parties to the, the convention. And they call these conferences after the names of the cities where they take place. So this was COP3 in Kyoto. Um, and so they, the, they produced there the Kyoto Protocol. And it said basically that the advanced countries agreed to reduce their carbon pollution first, as had been indicated back in 1992. That was the main substance of, of the Kyoto Protocol. And the European countries mostly agreed to it, but um, and at that time we had uh, our president with President Clinton, um, Bill Clinton, with Al Gore as his vice president, and they wanted to to sign this Kyoto Protocol. But as it was a treaty, it had to be uh, confirmed by the U.S. Senate, and the Senate rejected it. The Senate said no. Um, if the we, if we needed an agreement with with the developing countries, have to be part of it. And so even though the United States in 1992 had, had signed and supported um, the, the original convention saying advanced countries need to take the lead, now they, they, they backtracked. So no, we're not, we're not gonna, gonna play games, play ball, unless the, de the developing countries also start reducing their carbon pollution right now, essentially rejecting the right to development. Well, the United States is the, the most powerful country in the world. Um, and so without U.S. involvement, that basically took the air out of the whole UNFCCC process. The European countries moved ahead with the Kyoto Protocol, and they did various things to reduce their carbon pollution, but it just wasn't nearly enough. And so what we saw is, and you saw from the previous graph, that greenhouse gas emissions at the annual levels continue to increase despite, despite the UNFCCC efforts. Then it took a long time. It wasn't until until 2009, um, I guess about 12 years later, that we had more more kind of progress in the system. Um, part of why it took so long is because we had a, a Republican president, um, the second George Bush, uh, from 2000 to 2008, and the Republican Party has become increasingly opposed or was becoming increasingly opposed to doing anything about climate change. And so he was he was not prepared to take any kind of leadership. It wasn't until we had um, President Obama elected in 2008 and 2008, then his Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, she went to this COP15 meeting in Copenhagen. And it was partly through, it was with significantly through her, her efforts, supporting, su supported by, of course, the developing countries that the advanced countries agreed to provide $100 billion, billion a year to help the developing countries with mitigation and with adaptation from 2020. Again, this is kind of funny, maybe, that you know, in 2009, they say, okay, we're gonna start with 100 billion a year from 2020. Um, partly that's because uh, 
it's easier to make political co commitments for people in the future, but also this is just how, how these things work. But still, there was not agreement on um, how to reduce carbon pollution. That took another few years until 2015 with COP21 in Paris. And then we got to the famous Paris Agreement. Now, remember, it was in 1992 that the um, UNFCC got started committing to, to, to avoid human caused harm to the climate system. By then, it was already happening. Um, uh, but, and so finally, then, we come to come to an agreement that includes basically all the countries in the world. Um, it was critical to get both United States and Chinese agreement behind this to allow it to go forward. The goal of COP of the Paris Agreement, as you probably heard, is to limit global warming to well below two, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. The thought being that, that, that if warming above that caused such great harms. But the main means to achieve this goal was what they called nationally determined contributions. That is, each country would just decide how much it wanted to contribute towards achieving this goal. Not a very good approach from my perspective. Also, the Paris Agreement reaffirmed the commitment to $100 billion per year by 2020. And at the, at the re request of the developing countries, they added the principle to balance the, the spending on mitigation and adaptation. The advanced countries basically wanted to push for faster mitigation because they wanted to reduce the carbon pollution, but the developing countries said, look, uh, we need to be part of this and we have all the, have much more adaptation costs. So the, the money should be split roughly equally between, between mitigation and adaptation. However, I think the Paris Agreement, as much as I was you know, excited at the time, um, was a very, a very weak agreement. The nationally determined contributions are voluntary. Each country can just do, do whatever they want, whatever they say. It's, it's not coordinated. It's not based on responsibility. Um, at that time, uh, in 2016, these NDCs summed to three to three and a half degrees Celsius of warming by official calculations, much more than the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius that was, that was part of the agreement. So they said, look, this is our target, but in terms of their first round of commitments, they didn't come anywhere close to making these targets. Also, these commitment, the, the, this, this global warming effect is by official calculations of um, how much warming you get from, from certain levels of carbon pollution that come from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, um, I've looked into this pretty carefully, and I think they tend to be a bit conservative. Um, I think that the, the amount of carbon pollution that would have come from nationally determined contributions in 2016 would probably lead to maybe even more than three and a half degrees Celsius of warming, um, they, or at least on the high side there, but um, that's just another factor. Even though in 2016, the commitments would have led to a, this you know, three to three and a half degrees, actual national behavior at that time, some to about four degrees Celsius of warming by these official calculations. Also, um, there, were no there was no consistent approach to calculating emissions across countries. There wasn't any consistent monitoring for different countries. And most importantly, if you didn't reach your target, there was no sanction, no consequence for not reaching your target. So um, pretty, pretty, pretty weak, pretty weak, uh, agreement from my perspective. To get a bit more insight for how this works, you can look at the Paris, the, 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 the commitment from Vietnam um, there to the Paris Agreement, their nationally determined contribution. At that time, Vietnam had 2.3 tons per person of annual CO2 carbon dioxide emissions, well, in 2017, compared to 16 tons per person at that time in the United States. So as I said, you know they were um, they were a rapidly industrializing country, but they were pretty poor. They didn't have anywhere close to our our carbon pollution. Their their commitment was they said they intended to cut emissions by eight percent from the business as usual scenario by by 2030. Um, so they say, look, if we if we continue industrializing the way we want to, then um, in that scenario our emissions would more than triple 
from 246 million tons of carbon dioxide in 2010 to 787 million tons of carbon dioxide in, in 2030. That's what they expected with the business as usual development scenario that they were hoping for. So their commitment is that, okay, instead we'll have this 8% cut. And instead of more than tripling, we'll only triple it, we'll only triple our carbon pollution um, from, from 246 to 744 metric to million tons in, in 2030. However, if we get financial and technical support is provided through the Green Climate Fund, the fund that the Paris Agreement set up um, for help for the advanced countries to help the developing countries, then we intend to increase the emission reductions target to a 25% cut from business as usual to 652 million tons by 2030. So look, that still goes up from 246 in, in 20, 2010 to 652. So it's all kind of, I don't know, kind of, I don't know, not, not really imaginary numbers, but questionable, questionable numbers. And this speaks to the political situation um, uh, in, in terms of, of, of the way the developing countries were looking at it and how the advanced countries were looking at it. What about the issue of climate finance? Um, well, despite the 100 billion target that was agreed in 2009, jumping forward to 2020, the total aid was going through dozens of channels. It wasn't just going through the Green, the green Climate Fund. Um, and it was officially estimated at about $80 billion in 2020, not the $100 billion that had been committed. Um, the Green Climate Fund, which had, uh, it's under, it's part of the UNFCC, we can say, uh, uh, organizational architecture. It has equal management, uh, management power for the advanced countries and for the developing countries. It only had about $10 billion in it. Um, most of that money was channeled through the traditional well-established uh, development assistance agencies, the US foreign aid, USAID, World Bank, Japanese aid, British aid, German aid, UN agencies, et cetera, um, where the advanced countries had the predominant power. Um, also, if we look at this $80 billion, it's kind of questionable. Uh, a lot of it was based on loans, which developing countries have to pay back. So it's not really sure how that should count. There's a lot of double counting, even triple counting, where money first goes through one agency, then through another, then through another, and it gets counted two or three times. There was a lot of recategorization of traditional development assistance. These agencies have been around for a long time. They're providing help in, in sanitation, in agriculture, in other areas that say, okay, this aid we're already providing, now we're gonna call it climate aid, count it as part of our, our, of our contribution, which is again, kind of questionable. And even though there was commitment to having 50-50 mitigation adaptation, still for a few years anyway, the majority of aid was for mitigation, which the developing countries were not so happy about. Also, the way the, the money is transferred is when developing countries request projects. And basically, the, the, more, um, the, 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 the less vulnerable, the more like the middle income developing countries or the, are, are, are just better at, at requesting projects. Um, also, uh, these are projects requested by governments and the governments are usually focused on what's, what's important to them, not the harms often to the, to the most vulnerable people within those developing countries. So we, we see both that the poorest countries, um, they're just not good at requesting projects, so they get less, they get less funds and within countries, the money doesn't really go to them to support the most vulnerable people because the national politics just pushes in a different direction. Well, let's jump forward again. So um, in 2021, a couple of years ago, um, COP26 uh, took place in Glasgow. By then, there had been some significant improvement in uh, carbon pollution. The carbon, carbon pollution had been going down this is largely because we've seen that solar and wind energy has just gotten way cheaper, way faster than anyone really had, had expected. And by now, it's actually cheaper to, to generate new, if you're going to be generating new electricity, to generate it from wind or, or solar in most places, um, than even to generate it from coal or, 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 or oil. Um, 
Although, again, it depends on, on if you have those resources, you know, in, in your own country. Um, but, for, but for whatever, uh, there was significant progress. And so by then, the best estimate was that, that the policies at that time would lead to 2.6 to 2.7 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100, with an uncertainty range between 2 degrees Celsius and 3.6 degrees Celsius. And again, I think that, um, that it's probably more likely to be closer to 3.6 than, than 2 degrees, just based on the way they do the math. But whatever about that. So it was, you know, not yet, um, not yet close to really the the 1.5 to 2 degree target from Paris Agreement, but it was an improvement. Also, at that time in 2021, if countries meet both conditional and unconditional nationally determined contributions, we saw um, for Vietnam the unconditional NDC was 8 percent. The conditional one was 25 percent if they get this other help, um, then that would lead for the near-term targets of 2030, projected warming by 2100 falls to 2.4 degrees Celsius with a range from 1.8 to 3.3 degrees Celsius. Uh, again, so the, the commitments were getting a bit better, but let's remember these commitments are just on paper. Um, they weren't being monitored uh, and there are no consequences if you don't, if you don't reach your commitment. What about the right to development? Well, let's jump forward now to, to very recently, COP27 in Egypt, Sharm El Sheikh, um, November 2022, where the advanced countries now, you know, they're saying, all right, we're nowhere close to getting to our uh, Paris Agreement target. So we've got to we've got to have all the countries just pushing on this. Every country needs to do what it can. And so they tried to, have to include language about focusing, about phasing out coal. But China and India both depend very, very heavily on coal. They have significant coal resources. It's, it's going to be harder for them to switch quickly to, to um, wind and solar, other, other renewable sources. And so I think to understand the politics of this, it's helpful to look at the per capita annual carbon pollution from, from three countries. Um, by then, the United States was around 15 tons per person per year. China was at eight tons per person per year and India was at two tons per person per year, while the global average was five tons per person per year. Now, this actually gets into a bit of the background politics, and that is that the, the developing countries are counted as all those who were developing in 1992 when the original UNFCCC agreement was established. And so China was at that time a pretty poor developing country. Since then, China has industrialized incredibly rapidly. Um, it's now an upper middle income country with, with, you know, it's the manufacturing center of the world and their carbon pollution is three tons above the, the global average, eight compared to five. India, by contrast, representing, you know, more of the situation of most developing countries. And if we look at African countries, they're mostly behind India, was still just at two tons per person, way below the, the global average. Um, and also they have a lot of coal, so, so they were wanted to keep basically keep using that coal. So I would say that, you know, if we look, if we step back and ask, well, what is kind of fair, what makes sense? US should be reducing really quickly, uh, should be reducing carbon pollution, but China should also be reducing its carbon pollution. India, you know, in term, if there's a right to development, then they should have a chance if they need to, to increase their carbon pollution unless they can get more help um, financial and technical support for the transition to to uh, to wind and solar to to renewable energy, um, and then if we look at the developing at, at, at some of the poorer countries again, like most of the countries in Africa, they're way below two tons per person per year, and they're not at all industrialized, and so the right to development for them would seem to imply either continued use of coal and other carbon sources or a lot of help to rapidly transition to renewables, you know, probably mostly solar and wind. At the same time, we look at the bigger, bigger politics here, we see the advanced countries cutting separate deals to support reduction of carbon pollution outside the UNFCCC framework. For example, with South Africa and Indonesia, they're saying, look, we're gonna give you some, some money, we're gonna help you out. If you cut your carbon pollution more rapidly, 
And on the one hand, that's a positive thing because of course we wanna see South Africa and Indonesia, both big carbon polluters, um, reducing their carbon pollution. But by stepping outside that, the UNFCC framework, they also weaken that framework. Um, and uh, if we want to see all the different aspects, mitigation, adaptation, and climate migrants dealt with effectively and justly, they need to be considered altogether. And I, and, and, and I think the, 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 the UNFCCC has to be the place for that. And so by pushing it outside that framework, it just undermines that process and weakens the international collective negotiations. So where do we stand in terms of mitigation? Well, the biggest issue is that the current framework, which is the Paris Agreement, is voluntary. So whatever commitments we see, they're just whatever any country uh, agreed to, they have no sense of, of, of who's responsible. Of, of, um, they're not related to historic or current responsibility. Um, it just puts the onus on each country. Uh, it's also, it's again, I think the key issue there is, is there's no consequences if you don't, if you don't keep to your commitment. Um, so these are, you can say, commitments on paper, but but we've seen time and again um, in, in in the UNFCCC and in, in other other international negotiations, um, people just making a commitment and then just reneging, you know, saying, okay, okay, I'm not going to do it, and if and if and if they don't do it, just nothing happens. Um, in terms of our current situation, the developing countries they're just going to need a lot of financial and technical support if they're going to both reduce their carbon pollution and also increase their energy use as they need to do to industrialize. To achieve the rapid greenhouse gas emission reductions for the Paris targets, we need an agreement with teeth. We need consequences for, for exceeding fair emissions targets and for failing to fulfill obligations. Um, if this is all gonna work, it's gonna be expensive. And the advanced countries have caused the problem. The developing countries are suffering most of the harms. It's going to mean a lot of, of financial resources um, uh, transferred. And I think the current, everyone knows basically that the current 100 billion, even that, even though we haven't reached 100 billion, it still is actually nowhere near enough. For all of this for mitigation, it's going to require much stronger international organization to um, handle the finance, but also to implement these, these transitions um, from, from carbon polluting, polluting energy sources to, to renewable sources, if we're talking about in electricity production, in steel production and other manufacturing, in, in, in the vehicles people drive, uh, in the way we, we, we heat our homes, cool, cool our houses, all these things, so much depends is, is using carbon fuel today, switching to renewables is just an, an enormous practical task that, that countries are not ready for, it's gonna take stronger international organization to support that. For adaptation, remember we're talking about harms from things like drought, sea level rise, stronger storms, hotter weather, rapidly changing ecologies. You've probably talked in this class about the acceleration of the sixth mass extinction. Um, it was already going on, but climate change is increasing extinction of so many species, um, uh, insects and various things that, that, that lead to all kinds of harms. Um, so so the, 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 the cost these harms tend to fall more heavily on the developing countries, and they're not ready to, to, to address them. So, so the cost of cost of adaptation is, is pretty high. Well, the current international system to support adaptation, as I've said, the funds are just woefully inadequate. It's not nearly enough for what's needed for effective adaptation. And as I've said, they're channeled through hundreds of established aid organizations, which is just, is just really inefficient. Um, uh, for reasons that we've discussed, and which seldom reaches the people who need it, need, need it the most, the most vulnerable. And what about climate migrants? Well, part of the whole, uh, from my view, problem with the UNFCCC architecture is that it focuses on mitigation adaptation, and these are really important, but it, does, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't address the issue of climate migrants. And um, uh, as I've said, I think they're the ones who are really suffering the most from carbon pollution. People, you know, if their, their homes are flooded out, 
we're basically talking about people uh, who've been farmers, who, who face drought, or who live close to close to the coast and face a uh, sea level rise. Maybe they are farmers, and 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 there's the, the sea level rise leads to their their land getting getting um, covered with salt or too much salt in their land, or their water supply gets gets too much salt in it from the sea sea level, or maybe just because of sea level rise, um, they lose their land, or they're more vulnerable to floods. Um, when they have when they have strong storms, um, and and mostly we're talking about people going from from wherever they live, basically going to slums uh, or un informal settlements uh, in the in in the countries where, where they live. There's a, a small proportion who migrate internationally, and these have been sort of the more sort of sort of hot topic uh, political issues. People are concerned about about climate migrants flooding flooding the borders. Of, of United States, of European countries. And that's a concern, but overwhelmingly, the majority of climate migrants are within their own country. Um, and their governments are just, just completely unprepared to deal with this challenge. And so, you know, they move to these slums and they have really pretty, pretty, pretty very difficult lives. Um, so what's happened with climate migrants? Well, we know that there have, there's been $100 billion committed for adaptation and mitigation within UNFCCC, but it for, for migrants, it only has a task force on displacement to address these issues limited to 14 members. Um, there's no dedica dedicated funds for climate migrants. The Paris Agreement only, only mentions climate migrants once and, and just in passing. Um, and again, basically, the advanced countries don't want to talk about it because they don't, don't want to accept responsibility for all the harms to climate migrants. And for the developing countries, they want to focus more on adaptation, fixing their economies, uh, uh, their, their infrastructure and such to, to address the effects. And the climate migrants generally are from more vulnerable and politically weak populations. And so in these international negotiations, they don't have much power and they get, they get ignored. Well, let's look at the numbers. Before climate change, the biggest source of migration, of forced migration, was conflict. And um, if we look at, at, at people who are forced to migrate by conflict and violence, refugees of one kind or another, the UNHCR used to be called the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the, the international organization that was responsible for supporting um, refugees and, and people displaced by conflict and violence. In 2022, they estimated that there are 100 million people worldwide um, in this category. That was actually more than ever in history um, for about 20 years from, let's say, 1990 to 2010. It was hovering around 40 to 50 million, million at any given time since, since 2000. Uh, it's been increasing pretty consistently, and now we're at about 100 million. Of these 100 million, a little over half 53 million are, are, are internally displaced persons within their own country called IDPs, um, and only 47 million are internationally displaced, international refugees or whatever. So by 2050, from my estimates, I think we might see up to roughly 433 million people displaced by climate change. That'll be about 4% of the global population. Uh, this number comes from 140 million displaced by sudden onset weather events. Um, uh, here we're talking about floods due to rising, floods coming from rising, li rising rivers, um, sea level rise, and then you have a big storm and the storm pushes that water uh, into, the, into the land and, and, and breaks down homes and, and floods fields and, and uh, makes water, salinizes the water supply so people can't drink the water. Um, 293 million by slow onset climate events. Slow onset here, we're talking particularly about drought. That um, means people, farmers can no longer make a living uh, off of farming, have to leave their homes. And also to some extent, um, slow onset from sea level rise, just when it doesn't, when it doesn't happen by a storm, but still people, people have the effect and, and various other slow onset effects from various other harms from climate change. So, I think we might see as many as 430 million, you know, very roughly 400 million. Well, that would be about four times the number of, of people displaced by conflict and violence 
And if you look at the way at the International System for Supporting Refugees and IDPs today, they're already very inadequate. Um, a lot of people don't have their basic human rights support. They're not getting, the kids are not getting education. There's not even enough food a lot of places. Um, this is for the people, the migrants we already have. If that number, if we have another 400 some million, um, that's gonna be an, a very heavy burden on, on our international systems that we're not even talking about. Um, this 400 million, well, if we have really strong mitigation, reducing carbon pollution faster, strong adaptation, and if there is also strong and egalitarian social socioeconomic development, maybe that would be reduced by as much as half, maybe only 200 million by 2050, but still um, uh, a problem that we're just not facing and that, that's gonna come at us one way or another. So what are then the responsibilities for heavy carbon polluters? Here, I think we should be talking about heavy carbon polluting countries, but you, if you want to, you could also talk about rich people um, because you know, as people get to be more and more and more wealthy, they tend to be more heavier carbon polluters. Well, I think that for the, for, for the heavy carbon, for the advanced countries, that they should have, they should face an earlier deadline for the developed than developing countries for carbon neutrality, for having um, zero net carbon pollution. For the Paris Agreement targets, they've been estimating, we need to get down to zero carbon pollution. Well, they say net zero, meaning that the amount going of carbon going into the atmosphere is also taken out on an ongoing basis. They say we need to be at net zero by 2050. Well, um, but if, if that's for the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Um, but if we're, if we're gonna use 2050 as a net zero target, then in terms of responsibility, the developed countries, the advanced countries, the, the heavy carbon pollution, they should come earlier by 2045. So for the right to development, the developing countries might come a bit later, maybe by 2060. Also for responsibility for heavy carbon polluters, they should be helping to cover the costs for the harms imposed on developing countries and on climate migrants. And that's just way inadequate today. There's gonna, we're gonna need incredible technical and organizational support for transitions to clean energy and for adaptation and migrant support. This is just, just big bureaucratic jobs that we don't have the organization set up to do those jobs. And the, the advanced countries are gonna need to welcome and integrate their share of climate exiles international climate migrants, even though most climate migrants stay within their own countries, in some cases, the, the, the systems are just gonna break down. We're already seeing this happening in, in some places. And you know, um, uh, if the systems break down in, 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 in a, particularly in, in the poorer countries, people are gonna have to leave. And so we, we are, we're already seeing some, and we're gonna see more international climate migrants, not anywhere near the majority. Most of them are going to stay within their own countries. But when we're talking about 400 million by 2050, we get to some pretty high numbers. And the advanced countries need to need to welcome them and integrate them. Right now, they're treated as economic migrants, and they, that means they get treated pretty badly. Um, there's no sense of, of of our responsibility for causing the problems that cause them to have to migrate. And for all of this, it leads to a need for much stronger international institutions. We're gonna need a consistent flow of billions of dollars. And I think the level of national obligation ought to be based on historic and current carbon pollution. Um, there should be consequences for governments and countries that do not fulfill their obligations. We particularly need to protect the human rights of domestic and international climate migrants. And we need to have technical and organizational support for transitions to clean energy and for adaptation supporting climate migrants. These are the central political issues that can only be dealt with at the international level. It's the, it's the UNFCCC, the international negotiations, where, where if these are gonna happen, they're gonna take place. And I worry that our discussions here in Kalamazoo at Western Michigan University in Michigan and, and in the United States, we focus more on, okay, how can we have our own reduce our own carbon pollution. And of course that's important. You know, how are we gonna adapt? How do we mitigate ourselves? But the key political issue is at the international level. Um, and so the question then is how do we focus political pressure here in the United States on our government to do the right thing 
um, to, to play the role that it needs to play in these, in these international institutions. Uh, it's gonna take um, much bigger, bigger international bureaucracies, a much stronger organization, a lot of money at the international level to carry out these tasks. And this will only happen with US support, probably with US leadership. And, and we don't really see that today. So by way of conclusion, the international, since the international climate change negotiations were launched in 1992, annual levels of carbon, global carbon pollution have continued to increase. The increasing costs of harm from climate change to developing countries are not being adequately addressed. The lack of policy on climate migrants is a gaping hole in the UNFCCC architecture, particularly con considering the scale of unjust harms I think this is the central climate justice issue. Here, again, you've probably in this class heard a lot of talk about climate justice, but I bet you that mo most of it is focused on injustices that take place here within the United States to vulnerable populations you know, among us, to, to um, uh, uh, people in, of, of color, um, native communities, et cetera. I don't wanna undermine in any way the significance of our, our injustices here within the United States. All of those are certainly important, but just in terms of the numbers, just in terms of the scale of the harms, the harms, the unjust harms imposed on climate migrants who lose their homes um, uh, is, is, I think, so much higher, so much worse than what we see in the United States. And, and it's being ignored. It's being ignored within the main organization that's supposed to deal with these things. Of course, we're going to need stronger international institutions for mitigation, adaptation, and support to, to, to migrants. And this has got to, can only happen with advanced countries accepting their responsibility. This is only going to happen with strong domestic political pressure on advanced country governments, particularly the U.S. government, due to our historic role and our, cur our current role in, in the international system. Um, I, I'll tell you, this is something that um, I'm already working on. And I will, I will personally be uh, uh, using my resources and whatever I can do to, to um, push the U.S. government in this way from, from my limited resources. But, but it's also an issue that will inevitably be part of your future, of your generation's future. And um, uh, I hope that your generation can do a better job than what the current leadership has done. Thank you.